Hello everyone, buongiorno e ben trovati. Welcome to this webinar dedicated to Con il mare negli occhi, with the sea in your eyes, a film written and directed by Paolo Mantis. For those of you who are joining us today for the first time, my name is Emanuele Amendola and I'm the director of the Italian Cultural Institute in Los Angeles. This program is uh, organized in collaboration with the UCLA Department of European Languages and Transcultural Studies, to which goes my uh, deepest gratitude for the friendship and support in presenting today's talk. Especially, I would like to thank uh, Thomas Harrison, professor of Italian at UCLA, uh, who really connected uh, the dots and uh, the speakers participating today and actually suggested organizing this uh, program. To give you uh, a little bit of uh, context, uh, Professor Harrison and I have been discussing the idea um, for a, this idea for a while after watching Paolo Magri's uh, film Con il mare negli occhi, which uh, I would assume you must have uh, also watched by now on our uh, Vimeo channel. This film is a very interesting take on the life and the works of a little known yet very fascinating Italian philosopher from Gorizia, Carlo Miguel Steder. Many people don't know about him even in Italy, so I'm quite happy that this generated interest uh, abroad, and I wish to congratulate uh, the film director, Paolo Magris, for casting some light on this author, as well as on two cities that are really at the opposite extremes of the Italian peninsula, Gorizia and Crotone. Today, we will have the opportunity to discuss the film, its inspiration, and uh, Carlo Miguel Steller, not only with uh, Paolo Magris, but also with a panel of uh, distinguished uh, experts, uh, composed of uh, Valerio Capozzo, who is Associate Professor of uh, Modern Languages at the University of Mississippi, Nina Bekovic, a PhD candidate at UCLA, and Andrea Capra, a PhD candidate in Italian Literature at Stanford University. Moderating and facilitating the discussion will be Professor Thomas Harrison. As I mentioned, Professor Harrison teaches Italian at UCLA, and uh, amongst uh, his most uh, recent publication, I would like to remember the book Off Bridges, a poetic and uh, philosophical account, University of Chicago Press, published in 2021. His fields of uh, specialization include the modern intellectual history, Italian critical theory, music, aesthetics, the, modern no the modernist novel, and poetics. Professor Harrison has edited a niche in Italy and the favorite Malice ontology and reference in contemporary Italian poetry, and with Professor uh, Gianmaria Novi, a broad study of contemporary Italian poetry called Ends of Poetry. So let me say grazie again to all the panelists who are here with us today and uh, to all of you for joining us. I'm now very happy to give the floor to Professor Thomas Harrison. Thank you, Dr. Amendala and thank all of the rest of you for participating. I'd like to introduce everybody very, very briefly because the flyer already does so. And after we've introduced the people, we would have a very quick um, summary of who Mikkelstader was by Professor Valerio Capozzo. And then we'll start asking the director questions. We'll go in a, in a circle and by around 40 minutes later, 35, 40 minutes later, we'll open it up to the floor. So it's my great pleasure to welcome today Paolo Magris, who is a writer and director living in Trieste. He's conceived and directed numerous theatrical productions dedicated to big towering figures in literature, such as Marguerite Yusonar, Rainer Maria Rilke, and Edgar Allan Poe. In the field of film, over and above a series of short films to his credit, he wrote the screenplay for the film Dietro il Buio, Behind the Darkness, which was presented at the Festival of the Cinema in Venice in 2011. Currently, he's finishing in collaboration with Paola Bonesi, a fiction film, a road movie really, shot in the forest of Friuli. This new film of his, which we'll be discussing today, Con il mare negli occhi, had its premiere at the Festa del Cinema in Rome in October of 2021. Following upcoming tours at other film festivals, where it will continue to be screened, the film should be finding distribution on TV. Our second participant is Valerio Capozzo, briefly introduced already, who is a professor at the University of Mississippi. I would just note here some of his more important works, the monograph entitled The Medieval Dream Dictionary, his co-authorship with Jacques Dallaran and Sean, uh, Sean Field, of A Female Apostle in Medieval Italy, The Life of Claire Brimini, now in press, 
He's edited volumes on Carlo Michelstader and on Giorgio Bassani. He's the president of the Associazione Sciascia, vice president of the Boccaccio Association. We have then uh, Andrea Capra, who is going to be a, uh, joining the Princeton Society of Fellows in September 2022, in enormous honor. He works on the phenomenology of horror, as well as the storytelling surrounding computational technologies and technological utopianism in the Silicon Valley. He's currently finishing that uh, PhD dissertation, I think filing in a week or two, the same is the case with uh, Nina Bjekovic. And uh, he's also done a master's thesis on our Carlo Mikostater. Nina Bjekovic instead is here rather than at Stanford, here at UCLA. Her dissertation also to be filed very, very soon is on Triestine literature. It's called The Other Others, Negotiating Alterity in Postmore Triestine Literature. It focuses on Claudio Magris, Boris Pahor, Giuliana Morandini, and Giorgio Pressburger. She also has articles on Fleur Jegui, Laura Pugno, Elodie Oblat, and Boris Pahor. So those are the four of us. And, um, and now I'd like to give the floor to Valerio Capozzo, who will introduce Carlo Mikostater to those of you who have seen the film, but probably would like to know a little bit more about this fascinating young intellectual. Valerio. Thank you so very much. And thank you, Director Amendola, for having me tonight. I'm very happy to see Thomas Harrison, my good friend, and, and my friend Andrea and Nina, and obviously Paolo Magris, on which I really enjoyed the movie, on this, as Thomas said, fascinating figure, and as Amendola said, not really well known. So here we are to let it be really much known. So let me share the screen. I hope you'll see well. Do you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Perfect. So let me introduce the figure of Carlo Michelstetter that was born in Gorizia, North Italy now in 1887, when the city was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Gorizia at this time was a very peculiar city because it was divided into three parts, which belonged to Slovenia, Austria, and Italy. And so Gorizia was a perfect embodiment of Central of Europe, or better, Middle Europa, a territory that is difficult to define, but where different cultures converged and created a very peculiar climate. At the time, Gorizia was a very cultivated city with a huge bright community, and it always had a strong spirit of political independence that found a positive outcome when the city finally joined Italy at the end of First World War in 1918. Gorizia as a city is the perfect symbol of Mika Stetter's family. It's a learned, educated family, sensitive to the arts and in which the main language was Italian, but at the same time, a family that shared with its own time the worst contradictions, such as the suicide of the older son Gino when he was living in New York City, and the one of Carlo himself in 1910 at the age of 23. And then unfortunately the racial deportation to Auschwitz in 1943, where his mother and his sister Elda were killed. His father Alberto was at the head of the insurance office in Trieste and president of the Gorizia's reading cabinet and director of the Dante Alighieri Society. But he pushed him son toward the study of literature. From his mother Emma Cohen Luzzatto, he inherited the love of French and German literature. And Carlo had a very strong bond with his sister Paola, who preserved all his works and papers until 1973, year in which she donated everything, every single document by Carlo to Gorizia City Library. So thanks to her memories, we know quite well the relationship that Carlo had with his family, especially as we said with Paola, but also with his father a very solid bond from which we see Carlo's strong personality emerge. In fact, at the time in which Carlo needs to choose an high school in Gorizia, Alberto pushes him toward the most prestigious school, since he understood Carlo's intellectual inclinations very early on. And during high school, during the high school, the Stack Gymnasium, Carlo shows great ability in Greek and in philosophy. And he also starts writing poems and he liked to draw, as we can see in the slide. 
Here we see uh, examples of his academic drawings, mostly from classical sculpture. But on the other side, he also has a freer kind of drawing that shows a more personal way to interpret society throughout caricatures. However, we can observe that his satires are not really a way to make fun of the subject, but rather an intimate trait that defines the personality of the subject itself. For example, in this slide, we can see a sort of X-ray of a disillusioned middle-class woman. She has inside her a demon without being aware of it. With this example, we are touching up on a critical concept of his philosophy, the difference between persuasione and rhetorica. Persuasion is, in other words, the effort to get out of the illusionary social system of rhetoric. So in 1905, he graduated from our school, from Gorizia, and he enrolled in the Department of Mathematics in Vienna, capital of the Middle Europa, in which were living intellectual personalities, such as Bertrand Russell, Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein, Sigmund Freud, just for example, among many others. But Vienna was also the place of Austrian protest against Italians. And for Alberto, the father, the, this did not look like the right place to go. So instead of going to study mathematics and philosophy in Austria, Carlo decided he preferred to take art and philology in Florence. What is Italy for, all, for an artist and for a philosopher? It is essentially the cradle of humanism and renaissance that is obviously the head of Greek and Latin thought. And so on October 21st, 1905, Nicholas Tetra began his journey to Florence. And he draws and writes along the way every moment for this life. But he also followed the track of many artists who did the grand tour in 18th and 19th century. And so his viaggio in Italy, his Italian journey, was a cultural and intimate journey in the roots of Western civilization, as we can pretty well see in his own drawing in this notebook. Here we are in Veneto, by Venice, still in Veneto, and going down by train to Tuscany before approaching finally to Siena and then to Florence. Once in Florence, he enrolled in the Department of Literature and Philosophy of the Istituto di Studi Superiori, that actually was the former University of Florence, where he majored in Greek philology. And he wrote a thesis that we all know about titled La Persuasione e la Rhetorica. But at the same time, we also know, we also know that Carlo committed suicide the exact day he finished it. In 2017, together with Professor Thomas Harrison, we published this book. The idea was then to work on the concept of history in different ways. The first which is the reconstruction of his personal life and of his works through the figures of his father, Alberto, as well as giving emphasis to the cultural climate in which Carlo grew up. The second way was to talk about history in Carlo Michelstetter by reconstructing the editorial path of his poems, discussing all the philological problems that we can encounter with works that were not intended to be published by the author. Another aspect was looking at how Michelstetter's philosophical approach has anticipated the history of 20th century. As you can see, I'm introducing elements that are quite important for a young man in North pre-Italy. <laughs> First World War. And so, poet, artist, and philosopher Carlo Michelstetter has never fit comfortably in every current of thought or art. And this is what makes him such a distinctive, intriguing figure. Framing him in the early 20th century is nearly impossible, except broadly within the habit of turn of the century, nihilism, and expressionism. Here you can see his self-portraits in a chronological order from 1905 to 1910. And notice the transformation of the philosophical self of Carlo Michelstedt. But now, and to conclude, thanks to Paolo Magri's movie, I think we can reconstruct Michelstedt's biography, philosophical and poetic contribution, and provide a new approach to an author that has multiple identities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valerio. And if we go back to the general screen, we'll start with um, our investigation of this excellent, very interesting film by having the director explain a little bit to us. Paolo Magris, 
you have told the story of Mikkelstader as a fiction rather than a documentary, insofar as you frame it with a woman, a young woman who is a student as well, who discovers uh, Mikkelstader and goes up to Gorizia and gets increasingly fascinated by him. And your film within this fictional frame, you know, the Corniche, tells his life, which we've heard from Valerio Capozzo just now. Uh, but it also expresses his philosophy. It shows his paintings and we get to hear his poetry. And um, it moves biographically in a chronological order to come back to the young woman back south in Crotone, another seaport. I'm asking you, it's, it's a very interesting um, and effective way of telling this story. I'm interested in why first you were interested in Mikkelstader as a subject of film and second, why you told the story in this uh, interesting way. Okay, thank you for, for your question. But first of all, I have to thank you all. Thanks to Dr. Amendola and the entire staff of the Italian Institute of Culture and obviously Thomas, Andrea, Valeria, Nina for the amazing job we have done for this webinar and this pro program. So answer your question, I have to say that, um, okay, I am lucky. I, I know Mika Stetter from young age as I had all his books at home. And immediately I was amazed by the, the deep, the profound level of his works. And uh, I asked myself, how is it possible that such a genius is still relatively unknown in the world? Uh, and so I decided to, to make something educational, so to speak, popular. First in theater uh, with a piece, and then with this movie. And for me, that has been natural uh, because, in my opinion, uh, Mikke Stetter, even when he writes about philosophy, like in his The Great Cities, uh, he still remains uh, an artist, in my opinion, an outstanding poet and writer. And for example, uh, his The Great Cities, uh, you can read it as a wonderful uh, poetry in prose with his amazing musical style. And it also works very good in theater. I, the monologue I appreciated or not that I put it in the film is really of a Shakespearean level. I, really, I cannot find something, something similar in the last century, maybe. Uh, there is no comparison. Uh, maybe I can find something similar, for example, in, in some uh, Ingmar Bergman movies like uh, the famous uh, confession of Antonius Blocks in the church in the seventh year. This is the monologue that I can compare to the monologue uh, of Mika Stetter. But uh, uh, really, really, in my opinion, he's uh, an outstanding, outstanding writer and poet. Um, and I think that for this uh, reason, I consider him to be, from one side, I can, is an iconoclast, is a, is a uh, thing that rip off, rips off, off the human being from all the superstructures, you know, beliefs, uh, ways of thinking, convention, and so on. But at the same time, he is uh, an iconoclast falling in love with forms. Okay. He, he Mika Stetter loves the entire universe of beauty, paintings, poetry, and so on. And the second question in why I did choose the structure, why I did uh, build uh, the structure of the screenplay. First of all, I have to say, to say that uh, the trip of the young girl uh, from Crotone to Gorizia searching for um, Carlo Michestet, uh, I wanted uh, not to be something simply intellectual. I wanted uh, something more, something deeper. Uh, and so the trip of the young girl is not only a trip, but it's a return. Because during the movie, uh, the girl identifies more and more with Yolanda de Blasi. Until in the end, you, maybe you can think, think that 
the girl is Yolanda, the Blasi in a trip outside uh, time and space. Um, so I did choose to 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 write this this plot uh, with the trip beginning from Crotone, Calabria to Gorizia. Thank you, thank you very much. Let's have some more questions, if you if you will. Um, Andrea Capra, would you like to jump in and ask? Of course. Her? Paolo, it's a great pleasure to talk about your production with you. Next time that I'm teaching Mikkel Sitter, it will certainly be on the syllabus because I think it's a great way of bringing together biography, his mm -hmm. philosophy, and uh, you know also his artistic production. Mm -hmm. um, along those lines, my question would be the following. Uh, as an instructor, I always find it very challenging to introduce Mikkel Sitter. Mm -hmm. He's such a, you know, he's someone who's bigger than life has all these uh, you know, many faces as Valerio's presentation introduced us to. So my question for you is the following. What was uh, in, in your experience of producing this movie, the most challenging aspect of, yeah. uh, you know, of kind of putting together all these different faces? Was there something that was so difficult for you and that took you a lot of uh, intellectual labor? Yes. Um, okay, um, to tell the truth, uh, to, to select and to edit uh, uh, the poems and the text of Mickey Stetter uh, and put it into the movie has been a very long and hard work. Um, because, first of all, because, excuse me, because, uh, first, of, first of all, because uh, this youngster died so young, he was able to to do a lot of stuff, letters, poems, uh, writing, and so on. And second, uh, because um, I had to put poems, letters, and writings into a current narrative form, no? where all is connected, uh, where poetry, philosophy uh, is uh, all uh, is part of a, are part of a bigger picture. Um, and the most challenging part of this work. Uh, was to find a balance between, a good balance between the, the necessity to be not too simplistic, but also not too difficult. This was the most challenging part of the, of the, of the job. Thank you. Nina, do you have a question for uh, Paolo? I have many questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I, it means the world to me to be here um, discussing this film with you guys. I, um, I'm honestly, I don't know where to begin, but um, as Professor Harrison mentioned, I am working, well, completing a dissertation on Triestine literature, particularly the post-war period. And I never expected Mikkelstedt to be such a big part of it. And it became, he became a a robust point of reference for me. And that was a pleasure to discover. I found myself continuously going back to Persuasione Retorica. And so my question would be, as a person who knows Mikkelstetter's relevance and value, um, why Mikkelstetter, why now? And the second part, I guess it's a twofold question, would be, does geographical distance play a role? Was it intentional? I know you briefly mentioned the trip from Crotone to Gorizia, but I'm wondering if, you know, Kundera, um, the Czech French writer says that we always speak to each other from a distance. Was this your effort to kind of reduce that distance to show that, you know, Mikkelstetter's value is, is also very palpable and, and clear even to an American audience? Okay, um, answering your first question, why now? But I think that uh, Mikkel Stetter uh, belonged to the tight and very, very small circle of the great, great, so great minds of the last century. Um, that, and so the thinking and the, the works of Mikkel Stetter is bound to be eternal, is outside by space and time. So it's not uh, the, now. Obviously, you can uh, you can find a lot of things in Mikestetter that are absolutely charming in, uh, in the day in the in the in these years in the, in, in, in the way in the world 
we are living in, but uh, really so so big is so a big a great mind that um, even in in three centuries it will it will be the same thing to to write or or to make a movie about about Nikisetta. Second thing is that you you are talking about the distance. Okay, mm, writing the the screenplay, I, ha I had a problem no? about uh, the main character of the girl. No? Uh, who, uh, where she comes from. Um, and I didn't find the solution. Uh, no, it was not easy for me to find a solution until I discovered the beautiful town of Crotone in, in Calabria, uh, a town that is at the same time so different from Gorizia, but also so similar. Uh, because it both uh, share a split identity between mountain and sea. Both are split at the extreme parts of Italy, north and south, almost forgotten peripheric places. But at the same time, at the center of, of, of symbolic uh, universes of the utmost importance. For example, Crotone of the Magna Grecia, that Crotone is the town of, of Pythagora, where maybe Western civilization is born. In Gorizia, of course, of the Austrian Empire. Uh, post hungarian empire. So this connection uh, um, uh, was for me very convincing. And so I decided the girl has to be from Cortone. And then obviously when I discovered that uh, Yolanda de Blasi was Calabrian, uh, I, 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 I did find the solution also for the plot. Okay. Valerio, how did you like the movie and what would you like to ask? Uh, I have many questions, actually, and uh, I'm undecided, but I would like to follow up after Andrea, uh, Andrea's question and Nina, since we, they were talking about Mika Stetter in the classroom, and I totally agree with Andrea, and I think the future will be easier for us, thanks to this movie, uh, to introduce it to American students. And I agree with an interesting what Nina was saying about the post-war 318 literature. And while I was uh, interviewing uh, Mauro uh, Kovacic, an Italian writer from Trieste, um, and he who lived in Gorizia as well, the city so of Mika Stetter, he spoke of him as a romantic image, like a sort of literary Jim Morrison, which for us in Gorizia was one of the reasons we read it. So I think it's kind of interesting that, and so in, European, in, in your opinion, Paolo, what is the image I can say of Mika Stetter, the young people who see your film will have. Well, I, I think that I did describe Mika Stetter not as a myth and not uh, as a superhero, uh, but I, I think that I did describe Mika Stetter as a sure, sure as a genius, a standard genius, but at the same time, same time as a young boy with all the contradiction and the weaknesses of the human being. Um, because um, I, for me, it would be something not correct to, to, to describe him as a, as a Superman or, a Superman or, 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 or even as a, as a rock star. Sure, Kovacic is talking about the similarity between Mickey Stetter and the and rock star. Sure, and Mickey Stetter did, did fulfill all the requirement of a, a classic, uh, story of the rock star, no? genius, rebellious, uh, beautiful, uh, and in the end also self-destructive. No? Um, so Coach did spoke about uh, this week about um, Jim Morris, sort of Jim Morris. No? I also could say that we can compare Mickey Stetter also to other person or poets. I, I, I think, uh, for example, about uh, Luigi Tenko, for example, that even physically is amazing, uh, similar to Mickey Stetter. If you look at a picture of, of him, uh, was a song, songwriter, Italian songwriter who wrote uh, sad and melancholic songs, beautiful songs, and that uh, and who did shoot himself in his twenties. Uh, and was the generation of poets and songwriters like uh, the Andre. Of course, uh, Genio Montale, all affected by this sort of pain of living. 
We're going to enter another round of questions, beginning with me, and I tell the audience to think of your own questions, put them into the chat, so that way, after this round, we can also entertain your questions. Mine is, um, this polyhedric, this polymath figure uh, is, uh, is fascinating for that reason. Um, and he's a multicultural figure as well, because he's Jewish, but Italian, mm -hmm. and an Austrian, and all of that at the same time. Um, but the most interesting thing for me in Mikkelsteder is his uh, ethical philosophy. Mm -hmm. And that uh, comes across very strongly in the, in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, the pressures, the ethical pressures he sets himself, which uh, after Mikkelsteder came to be associated with existentialism, mm -hmm. the emphasis on authenticity, mm -hmm. on tearing off the mask of, um, of insincerity, that mm -hmm. the protagonist of your movie, that is the Yolanda figure, because you have two really, she is uh, resonating with deeply. As a matter of fact, the first scene shows her a little distant from her fellow um, women there. Mm -hmm. And um, this emphasis on authenticity of trying to be yourself also includes something I found interesting that didn't need to be emphasized, uh, but you did, which is the polemic with society, mm -hmm. with society as that which constrains the individual and forces him or her to wear a mask and um, that intolerable play acting that that we get in, get with, that we engage in. If I had a question, it would be this Mikkelstater clearly, or you know, it's a question rather than a statement. Do you think that this Mikkelstater speaks precisely to the young? You made the movie for a purpose. You seem to be endorsing his ethical message. Could you tell us a little bit about why today you think that's still important? Okay, I think that the reason why is because, uh, as you said, the, the main enemy for Mikkel Stetter was insincerity, sure. If you read his, his philosophic, philosophical writing, even his poem, his letter, uh, for him, the inner freedom was the most important things against uh, society, social pressure, ideology, okay, all of this. And, uh, and, and I think that for a uh, young uh, boy or girl of, of our times, this is very, very, very important. Uh, and uh, everyone can find in Mickey Stetter something very, very, very uh, fascinating from this point of view. Because uh, in our society, it's, it's very, very easy to, to, to lose uh, ourselves in society and masks. And now, now more than yesterday, sure, this maybe is the problem, the most, the most um, incredible problem of our time. So, for this point of view, Mikkel Setter now can be very, very inspiring for young people. Absolutely. I think so. Thank and you. I think. Oh, I, I, and I would add that, that when Mick Stetter said that uh, we have to fight wars by wars, uh, he did mean that we have to not, not to fight the, the forms uh, of our, or, or, or our world for reaching a, for reaching a um, pointless void, but for um, fight the world's lie. The first, the first enemy in our lives is the lie. I think yeah. so. Which is growing, as you as you note. Nina, you have a question. I think I think this is very interesting. Is using you know rhetoric to expose its limits, to expose the the limits of rhetoric. Um, we can't but help to do that. And I think the question of authenticity is. Mm -hmm is very pertinent today because, um, you know, when thinking of identity, I found working on, on my dissertation, especially precisely what you said, I think is um, Mika stated underscores that the more we try to assert and explain our authenticity and define it and to articulate our difference, the more it evades and it almost seems less inauthentic. Mm -hmm. So I found that very interesting. One thing that I wanted to ask about is the presence of the feminine 
which mm -hmm. is undeniable in Miguel Steder. And it's certainly palpable in your film as well. And also, you know, his relationship with his mother and his sister and then these wow. female figures that we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us about the process of kind of thematizing or, or dealing with the feminine in your, in your film? Why the central figure is a woman? I know you, you already kind of touched on that, but how you went about selecting the poetry for the film. If you could just tell us a little bit yes, about yes. that. I think that uh, all the movie turns uh, around uh, the contrast of the of the opposites. Um, for example, dark and light, interior voice and and landscapes, uh, music and silence, uh, and also female and uh, female and male. Um, and so I immediately when I did start to to write the, the plot. I was absolutely sure that the main character has to be a girl, a, girl, a young girl at the same age of, uh, of Palomek Estate. And the, obviously, uh, because the trip has to be, like I said before, a return, okay, uh, to in, in the plot, in the movie, the girl. Uh, Fulfills, uh, no, fulfills that um, uh, what what's, what's missing in the past. No, okay, okay. And in in, in in the process of identification with with, with Yolanda, and so from this point of view, the point of view, like I said, is um, really really a, a coming in age uh, story. No? The, the, the the main character, from technically speaking, the main character of the movie is the girl. Because, because the process of, of transformation affects the girl. This is interesting in, in the movie, I, I think so. so. Thank you. Hmm? Andrea, what's on your mind? Thank you, Thomas. Uh, um, yeah, talking about transformations, hmm? Paolo, um, I, was very, I was very pleasantly surprised by you choosing the Canto delle Crisalidi mm -hmm. as one of the central texts uh, that you depict uh, and, uh, and narrate and choose to narrate uh, in, uh, in your work. Uh, um, I remember encountering that text first in high school. Uh, it was my first encounter with Mikkel Sitter, actually. It was my second or third year of, uh, of high school. And, and it's a text that has been haunting me ever since. Uh, and uh, I thought of, uh, um, of reading out loud uh, the Italian version uh, of the canto for uh, those of uh, those of you that may have only had access to the English um, dub of the movie. Can you see my shirt? My mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I think that it's a really interesting text to kind of appreciate uh, in its oral form. So I will transition to Italian for just one second now. Vita, morte, la vita nella morte, morte, vita, la morte nella vita, Noi col filo, col filo della vita, nostra sorte, che l'amma questa morte. E più forte è il sogno della vita, se la morte a vivere ci aita. Ma la vita, la vita non è vita, se la morte, la morte nella vita. E la morte, morte non è finita, se più forte per lei vive la vita. Ma se vita sarà la nostra morte, nella vita viviamo solo la morte. Morte, vita, la morte nella vita, vita, morte, la vita nella morte. So when I first uh, read this text, as I was saying, I was haunted by, you know, the, the rhythm of this poem. It, it, it really made me, it really made a strong impression on me because it seemed to be true, right? I didn't really understand what the content was, uh, you know, these two topics kind of chasing one another, life and death. Mm -hmm. However, it was almost as if I were reading a magic formula, um, you know, some sort of like more Bose rosary. So my question to you, why this text? Why such a central position in your uh, doc movie? Okay, I think that uh, uh, you and I, we share the opinion that this poem in, in, a, sort of, in a certain way is mesmerizing. You know? When you read it for the first time, you are totally totally shocked by, by the poem. It's also, I, I think that it's also a mystery. There is not really a, a, an explanation for it. But the reason why they choose this poem, I think that there are two or three main reasons. The first of it is sh sure, it's also 
a very intense poem, plenty of also of drama, of intensity, or even of passion, uh, I think so. And so I put uh, it in the ending part of the movie where Mickey Stead is living his last weeks. Uh, um, another reason is because uh, it's a poem that contains endless meanings. You can find uh, really a universe of meanings. Uh, it's very open, in my, in, in my opinion, this poem. It's, it's a form of poem that is open to, to a, a, a tons of interpretations. The third reason is because um, talk, this poem talking about death and life. Um, sure, uh, sure, Mikestet uh, has been influenced by a lot of, of philosophical currents, like, uh, of course, Greek philo philosophy, Judaism, uh, of course, Schopenhauer, modern philosophy, but also from, from Eastern philosophy. He was a great reader of Buddhist texts. And um, this poem talking about the connection between life and death in contrast with the Western classic Western opposition between uh, life and death reminds me um, of a famous uh, uh, Buddhist quote, a, Bo a Buddhist sutra that says uh, form is emptiness and emptiness is form. Uh, so I, this, this connection between the two sides of the same coin, uh, uh, for me, I did find in, inside uh, a deep meaning. It's interesting the, that you bring up the Eastern philosophy because mm -hmm. that poem um, represents an obsession with Michael Stater, which is mm -hmm. the, the um, inextricability of opposites which you referred to trying to represent by nature, thought, male, female, mm -hmm. the paradoxical assertion that death is life and life is death uh, is, was very terrifying at that point for the West. I mm -hmm. think the East, of course, mm -hmm. recognized that many centuries earlier. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Mikko Stater's uh, ethical enterprise is very, very difficult to, to achieve. And that's why he, uh, he sort of slips at a certain point and takes his own life. That's uh, an act that's been much debated since, whether, whether that was necessary or something that just uh, should have been avoided and could have been. As we know, many suicides are impulsive suicides. So, um, but on the question of the poetry, Valerio, I know you've worked a lot on uh, Mikostater's poetry. Yeah. What, what can you help us um, understand about his, uh, his style and his, his place, perhaps, in the, in the canon? Well, first of all, I really agree with the obsession of opposites, and I like Andrea's reading of this simple, a first poem, or music, or canto, so this lyric, but to understand this obsession, to understand the struggle of her life that Mika Stetter had, I think it's very important to take a look of the manuscript that Mika Stetter made for this uh, particular poem, if you can see, I hope. Can you see the manuscript and the transcription? As you can see, when Andrea was reading, it looks like a very rhythm, you know, like a limpid poem. Like, can you see behind, especially this side, how Mika Stetter, so the author, was fighting with words and verses. So Mika Seto was produced something harmonic to our ears and our eyes and our mind, but behind we can once again see the struggle of his mind. This is typical of an artist. This is absolutely typical of a poet that in the 20th century is difficult to put in categories just because Mika Seto was fighting against categories and we, uh, uh, we are agree with it. We know they was inspired by 19th century poet like Giacomo Leopardi, obviously in the canon, and especially for the philosophical point of view of the relationship or opposition with nature. In 20th century, like Gozzano, Adanegri, so the first early poet in the 20th century was surely reading and taking inspiration from. But as soon as he became adult, that means when he left Gorizia, it was, it was 1905, so he was really young actually. But that time he started a personal path 
into no poem, poetry as an expression of sophisticated grammar, but absolutely as the expression of the struggle itself, that through a manuscript, we can see all the fighting that's doing. And in fact, my last question to Paolo is, since we know, and if we go like, behind the time, the, the scenes, I would like to know how the actors reacted to Big Stature. I mean, I don't think for, a, for Yolanda, for the actors, could be easy to, to, to looking for uh, a, 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 an author like Mika Stetter as an actor. And so what do you wait for the audience to react to your movie as well? So behind the scenes being an actor with Mika Stetter and us as audience. Thank you, Paolo. Okay, the actor uh, really, they, they have done a, a, a great job in my opinion. They did work very hard because it was not easy to, to act. Uh, and Tommaso Sculin and Yasmin Karan, the two main characters, really, 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 they, they, they did work really, 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 really hard. And uh, for them, it was, uh, was a challenge, very, very interesting for them. Um, and, the, and generally speaking, um, the people who, who saw the film, they find it uh, um, rather easy to also to, to follow. You have to concentrate yourself, obviously. It's not, a, it's not a, okay, a, a fiction, a, a, but, but uh, the people who saw it, they, they think that uh, is able to catch a the attention of the viewer from beginning to end. That, is, that was the most hard thing to achieve in such a movie because it was very easy to, to, to lose the viewer. No? Okay, is this, um, uh, and also I found um, young people did appreciate, uh, appreciate uh, very, uh, very much the movie. Young, young people, students, for example, uh, the students of Crotone, of a school, of school in Crotone, and they saw the, 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 the movie in the school and they really, really did appreciate a lot the movie. They didn't understand uh, very, very well the movie and they did, they did feel uh, um, a great resonance uh, between their lives and, and, and the mood of the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great that the movie and so the author itself is still mm. speaking to young people that take mm. inspiration mm. from his life to start opening a book, reading, uh, entering this kind of dream of thought. Yes. As I, uh, as I open it up to everybody at this point, including the audience in our last 15 minutes, I wanted to uh, ask Paolo about the ending of the film. Mm. There, there, there is a fictitious coming together of the two protagonists, which is um, virtually erotic insofar as there is a simultaneous dream. Yeah. Surreal, of course, because Miko State is not in the present, mm. but the surreality of their coming together in this loving dream is uh, given fictional form by the very ending of the movie where Yolanda looks out the window, I believe, and she sees, I think yeah. it's, yeah. I think it's the same actor who plays Carlo Mikkelstader mm -hmm. yes. on the beach with a group of three yeah. or four yeah. people. Yes, absolutely. So I was wondering what, um, what you had in mind with that ending, because it's not as if the two of them come together and embrace, mm -hmm. although they did before, mm -hmm. they embrace each in his and her own bed. Yes. But uh, he's, in another social scene and she's looking at him. So could you comment a little bit about that yeah. interesting dynamic that you throw into the movie? Yes, All right. the, the scene where in a dream, a sort of true dream uh, is a love scene, is a love scene and is a, they are making love in a outside space in time no? in, the, in, in a dream, but in a dream that, that, that is, also, is also true. No? It, 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 it's, it's not a dream, a fictional dream, but it, in, my, in my opinion, in my intention was, was a, a true dream. 
And then the scene is because I didn't want to have, uh, so to speak, almost a happy end. It's a, what, what, what I mean, I mean that I, I want uh, an ending scene with hope. And when they, the girl sees Mickey Stett on the beach, uh, in my opinion, the scene has to has to means that uh, what is meaningful in uh, in life things and, and people are bound to be eternal to live to be everlasting for the eternity so i want to add a bit of the sense of the eternity and the, of the everlasting in the indian scene outside obviously space and time this um, this was my was my intention shooting the scene. I didn't hear you. Okay. I'm sorry, I was muted. Yes. There's also there's also a kind of return to life on yeah. the part of yeah. Yes. To the daily life that sometimes he criticized, but that he ultimately wanted us to uh, accept as the only mm -hmm. life there is, mm -hmm. with all its limitations, and to live it passionately. Mm -hmm. Would you, would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Because Mika uh, uh, I think Mika was split, obviously, with, with uh, the difficulties of the pain, uh, the pain of living. Uh, to, to live in a tent is, is hard, uh, it's not easy. But uh, he did love, did love life. He did, she did love passion. She did love relationships. She did love uh, friends. Uh, she did love. She did love. Uh, uh, I said before that he was an iconoclast for love with, with form, because uh, because sure he is, has an incredible and strong uh, sensitivity, but it's also dangerous in life to be too too sensitive too sensitive to things. <laughs> I think and maybe he paid the price for this, but uh, in I uh, I cannot find in Mikestetter in the poems in the in the writings in the letter nothing of pessimistic. This is my personal opinion. Nothing right. pessimist, no nor, nor pessimistic, nor neither pessimistic nor nor uh, nihilistic. So. Uh, so to speak. Leopardi, Leopardi, who was known to be a pessimist, said that um, that kind of hard philosophy is the greatest incentive to life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yes. It's actually encouraging. And I think uh, that... And we had to remember that Mikestet uh, did speak against self, uh, self healing, against suicide. So theoretically speaking, he was against it. So yeah. to transform Mikestet into a, a hero of a uh, Philosopher of the self healing, I think this is the worst mistake we can do with mm -hmm. life and thoughts. Right. I think maybe you are you are you didn't agree. So at this point, I'm inviting the audience, which I I did a few minutes ago, to come up with some questions and it and and as they think about it, I'd like to go around and see any concluding thoughts that we have among our panelists. Nina, could I start with you? Um. Yes, I guess. Can I squeeze in one last question? <laughs> Just yeah, yeah, sure. it's, more yeah, sure. ones that, it's about the beautiful imagery of nature and the sea specifically. It comes up a lot in my own work, and the sea is central. In Mare negli occhi, you know, we have the sea in the title. Um, and obviously, for, for Miko Stete, it, it holds tremendous importance. But it's also often in that context, in that literature it's often perceived as the homeland or the patria of the other, mm -hmm. of those who fit that they do not, um, you know, comfortably fit those categories uh, pre-established or pre-prescribed by society. So it, it can be seen as a patria of the other, dell'altro, no? So mm -hmm. I was wondering if, um, if this, you know, crossed your mind, if, if you can talk a little bit about it, even just more broadly in the context and your intent in the film with, you know, the nature shots and things like that. Yes. Um, sure, nature uh, plays uh, a very important role in the movie. I was talking before about uh, the, 
the balance no, between the, the, the inner voices and also the dark, the interior life of the main characters, but also with the openness of nature. No? And as Mickey Stetter did uh, love so much nature, for me, it was absolutely impossible not to show the, the, the nature Mickey Stetter did, did appreciate uh, so much. Uh, there are beautiful letters uh, of Mickey Stetter talking about his trips in the hills, of, uh, in the surroundings of Galicia. Uh, really, really amazing. Uh, so the sense of nature for him was so, so, so strong and, and so, so, so big, so, so connected also with, 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 with his poetry. Uh, that for me was even the most uh, fascinating also part of of the shooting to to find and to and to wait for 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 uh, for the the, uh, the moment the right moment to shoot for example for the sunset uh, you can see in Sal salvore i did want to have a, a real sunset with with the yellow with the yellow plates for the sun <laughs> but in salvore but but in salvore not every day there is a, a beautiful sun. So I have to go for one month every day waiting for the right sunset until I did catch it, <laughs> did catch it. So patience uh, we have for, for, for uh, making a movie like uh, totally independent like this, also passion did play an important uh, role uh, talking about uh, the shooting in, in, in uh, of natural. Right, and we haven't even asked you about the difficulties and the commitments that such a film requires. Yeah. It might have to be for another conversation. What about you, Valerio and Andrea? Some concluding questions or remarks? The, the thing is very interesting to me that Yolanda, so the main character, mm -hmm. is constantly writing to her friend. So she is constantly confessing weaknesses her journey to Mika Stetter as Mika Stetter, as I said at the beginning of our nice talk, he was constantly writing his impressions or letters to the family. Mm -hmm. So I see a strong parallelism. And we know, as we said before, that in Mika Stetter's life, friendship were absolutely fundamental for his philosophy, his thought and personality. Enrico Mreo, Lenino Paternoli, Gaetano Chiavacci, and so on, for example, and Vladimir Rangerul. And so I'm wondering how did you um, start from his Ciceronian, Ciceronian point of view of friendship, I would like to say, in the Amicizia, in, in the way in which we are a group of people that have to share our thoughts and our feelings in order to achieve the possibility to live better our life? Um, you, if I understand you, you are talking about the importance of, of friendships. Uh, in Mika Stetter and in your character. So I think you started from that, isn't it? Mm, yes, yeah, sure. Um, I, I did start to um, decide to talk about uh, the relationship with Yolanda. He had also other love stories, obviously. But I did decide to, to choose one uh, because I did want also to, uh, also to have a, a strong human experience of, of in the telling the life of mm -hmm. is that, uh, Because also from this point of view, he, for, for example, his letters, his love letters, his letters to friends and to, to his lovers are really, really beautiful, uh, written and, and plenty of, uh, of intense, uh, incredible, uh, intensity and passions. Um, so um, reading his letters, I, I did imagine, maybe it's true, maybe not, that the relationship with love story with Yolanda was the most important of his life. Uh, maybe it's not true, but uh, this is the, the fictional part of the movie, okay. Uh, I did imagine that this was the case uh, but so that did, uh, in my opinion, did add uh, value to the structure of the plot also. Thank you. Andrea? Um, 
yeah, you know, the last two questions, in my yeah. opinion, go really well hand in hand. Uh, um, it, the topic of nature and the topic of friendship uh, within this, you know, existential ethical framework of Mikkel Sutter are very connected insofar as, you know, Mikkel, Mikkel Sutter acted out uh, his friendships by going in nature. He would go mm -hmm. hiking with his friends. Mm -hmm. yes. He would go swimming. He did all sorts of things in that beautiful natural landscape. Uh, there of Gorizia, and uh, and even thinking back of uh, you know our discussion about poetry, um, you know we focused on the most more both aspects of Mikhail Seder's poetry here with the Cantile Chrysalis, so life and death and the inextricability of the two. But Mikhail Seder's poetry is also poetry of nature, of uh, of the cycle of seasons, of wind, of sun, of rain, of fog. So there is this really incredible richness uh, that belongs to his production. And so my, my last question to you would be the following. So is there anything that didn't make the final cut? I mean, we're talking about someone who's so polyedric, uh, someone who has so many faces. Was there something that you wanted uh, to, you know, to play somewhere in your movie, but you just couldn't do it because, you know, it would have been out of place, an element that you couldn't express in the movie? Yes, you're totally right. Uh, there is so much thing, so much stuff in mixed with, uh, life and, and, and uh, poetry and writing that uh, really the problem was uh, was not to find that interesting but to to cut <laughs> to to edit and but i i didn't want to <laughs> okay I, I i i did make the the greatest uh, the greatest uh, efforts to put uh, to, to put all in in the movie uh, life, um, poetry, um, a sense of nature, uh, importance of, of friendships. Uh, obviously, for example, I, I was very sad, uh, for example, for, for some letters, I uh, saw beautiful letters. I was eager to, to put into the movie, for example, other letters, other, other poems, obviously. Um, but uh, so that is, is, is a hard thing, but uh, you, you reach a point where you have to, to, throw, away, <laughs> to throw away something, something and, and that also is sometimes is very, very, very sad. Uh, and also because a, a movie like this is also is very important, the editing part. No? You, you should, and then you have to edit the, the movie. And the and, and, and editing you have to to decide for, for example for example also the length of the movie shorter or longer would be very dangerous no? to, to 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 add minutes to such a film would would be then some something is uh, not very easy to do so this um, is, you are perfect, perfect perfectly perfectly right in saying this. The difficult decisions of being. Uh, the to, to, to take that. And the screenwriter. That's, right, that's right. Controlling the, um, uh, the actors. Uh, well, I, we've almost run out of, we really have run out of time, but I wanted to, um, to conclude with a question to you about these provincial centers, which seem provincial, mm -hmm. but are not always. Mm -hmm. Crotone, you, you refer to it as peripheric, as, as Gorizia, always was and in some ways still is. On the other hand, isn't Gorizia becoming the cultural center um, and an honorary title that is taking up now in Europe? Could you tell us a little bit about Gorizia's newfound yes. relevance? Let's start the magic, I have to say, because during the shooting of the movie, uh, I did read in newspapers the, the news that uh, the European Commission did appoint Gorizia as uh, European uh, capital culture uh, for uh, 2025. That's amazing, that's amazing, really amazing. Because nobody could imagine such a thing. Uh, and that is very important uh, for, is an incredible opportunity for spreading the name uh, of Columbic State in the entire world. And, but also of Gorizia, that's, that's this small town, but that, that in my opinion has uh, a lot of things to, sh to show to the entire world. Uh, first of all, uh, Goethe has been a very important center of a cultural revolution like Futurism. 
maybe the, the most important uh, uh, painter, Futurist painter, is Tullio Crale. He's from Gorizia. Um, Gorizia hey, oh, has, has also beautiful landscapes, uh, uh, the winery. So there are a lot of, but, but I think that in those years that you did describe so well your beautiful book, the emancipation, sorry for my pronunciation, emancipation of dissonance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's very hard to pronounce on me. Hard in English too. Okay, so in those years that are so amazingly interesting, um, Gorizia uh, did play a very, very important role. Yeah, That's, yeah. That I, I, I am I'm, now I'm asking you uh, a question that if, if you think that uh, that Gorizia could uh, could be a, a topic of, of, of a growing uh, a subject of, of a growing interest. In, I think absolutely, and I'm and I'm, very happy. I'm, ha I'm very happy it's been recognized, and mm -hmm. I think your film helps mm -hmm. uh, underscore why because um, it was the Jewish center as well. It was a center of great learning. And one, one tends to forget this, this uh, Jewish um, dimension of Karlo Mikostater mm -hmm. and the very distinguished tradition from which he came. And there are other luminaries who were from Gorizia, thinking of Gilo Dorfles, for instance, mm -hmm. the uh, great art historian. So mm -hmm. um, these places that seem to be wiped off the map in, um, to favor Milan, Rome, Paris, mm -hmm. London, whatever, have a hidden history that it's part of um, of our job and our commitment, yours in primis, mm -hmm. uh, to celebrate. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm very happy to be part of this small community of of committed Mikostaterians mm -hmm. and uh, Goriziani. Goriziani, yes, yes. Um, I throw it out there as we conclude. If any of our panelists here want to have some concluding concluding thoughts. Uh, Ave, uh, how do they say, uh, Catullo used to say, salute, Ave, whatever, uh, before we say goodbye to each other. Anyone? Okay. I would just to add to the list of important person from Gorizia, Grazia Dio Isaia, ah, yeah, the yeah, world, yeah. a good yeah. linguist, and he was studying yeah. Italian language, and mm -hmm. Mika Stetter took a drawing, a portrait of him, mm -hmm. and showing the thing of philosophy of language as mm -hmm. well. So the yeah, drama yeah. of expression, that's another important thing. And then we're very happy and about the Gorizia 2025 uh, as capital of culture. And I'm sure that Paolo will invite us, all of us to see <laughs> in person in Gorizia. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> very soon. Well, yeah, thank you so well, much for today. Maybe it was a, <laughs> the right move in the right, in the right moment, maybe. That's right. Okay. Okay, well, listen, okay. thank you all so very much. Uh, first thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. And, uh, really, really Nina, beautiful. Nina, Andrea, and Valerio. And we'll, we'll do it again, I hope, there on, on the spot in your Trieste, Trieste Gorizia. We'll do another one, okay? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> We can organize something in, in, in the States about Gorizia in the next month or, or years so because, because for, for this reason, it will be. Uh, okay, well, we'll, we'll pick up on it on this side. We'll work on it on this side and you work on that side yeah. so that we can be sure to get back together. Oh, yeah, 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 okay, okay. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you all, thank, thank you, you very all. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Grazie. 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 Grazie.